In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And uh, all of these end-time events taking place, uh, I count it a privilege to be a part of this end-time church and uh, look so forward to what God is doing. These are not days to be afraid of. This is the day of which Jesus spoke when he said, when you see these things come to pass, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. And so we're not only looking up, but we're also looking out and we're, and we're eager about the harvest because the prophecy also includes that in the last day saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Everybody say praise the Lord. We're glad for the, we had uh, four receive the Holy Ghost last Sunday morning and uh, uh, three were baptized in Jesus name. John, you want to tell about your buddy that came? Yeah, yeah, right now, right here in front of these witnesses. Appreciate Brother John. Praise the Lord, church. Uh, I had a guy at work. We've been teaching Bible study for about four months. And uh, during last week, I brought baptism up, and he's like, he felt very excited. So uh, uh, he went to Monday morning. I was like, pray about it and think about it for a week. Monday morning, he went to his pastor. He's like, I'm going to join my church, and we're going to get baptized in three weeks. Well, I'm like, okay, I better prepare now <laughs> so we talked about baptism Friday morning I like why wait for three weeks when we could do it now and he felt very excited the entire thing was against us we brought him down Friday afternoon Antoine baptism he received the gift of the Holy Ghost I just praise God what he's doing praise the Lord that's where that's where ministry and craft come together where ministry is bigger than the four walls of a local church building, but rather we are the light of the world and we're out in our workplaces, our schools and our neighborhoods. And that's where people live and work. And that's where God wants to work. And uh, it's an exciting thing to, to see this happening. John's got about four people in Bible study there at, uh, at Honda. And we're expecting to hear more of those good reports. So uh, it's a great day. Uh, and we're excited. Uh, this is Ignite Week, and so it starts on Tuesday morning and uh, goes through Friday night. And because of that, we won't have service here on Wednesday evening, uh, and neither will we have next Sunday night because it's a time to spend with your family. If you, uh, I would encourage all the church family to make a trip or two over during the day sessions or the evening sessions if you have, uh, if you're able to do that. And this is a wonderful time of fellowship, and it's a great time of uh, worship and word and we're excited about the prospect of what it does in our in our kids our kids are really excited about it and so they go and they have a week at camp but they also have a week of day service and evening service and uh, they prosper every year from it and I think they prosper greatly so um, that's about the lay of the land we're going to read this morning from Exodus chapter 3 this evening we're going to be celebrating Dawson and Michaela who won the national championship in quizzing in their uh, their category and was it last year that Michaela was with Michael and won or was that the year before last year Okay, so uh, Michaela uh, is just this uh, phenomenal quizzer, and she doesn't happen to be a part of this church fellowship, but uh, her, her group doesn't have quizzing, and so she always comes down, and she's been a part of this, and so we're going to celebrate them tonight, and uh, so that's, that's wonderful stuff. Exodus chapter 3, and beginning in verse 13, and Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you and they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am 
hath sent me unto you. And God said, moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abram, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. And this is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. If you love his word and you're glad for it today as you're seated, let's give God praise and thanks for his word that is forever settled in the heavens. Mighty God, we praise you and we thank you and we worship you, O God, for your name, for the privilege of handling your word in this place. We thank you. Bless your name. And everyone said amen. Praise God. So we're making our way through Exodus, and here we are at the burning bush and at the revelatory moment, the uh, chirological event instant for the man, uh, the man Moses. And God has called Moses to go back to Pharaoh. And so as we make our way through this, uh, through this chapter, this is downstream from Moses' great deliverance uh, from the hand of Pharaoh, and uh, he was nurtured in Pharaoh's own home and raised by Pharaoh's own daughter. And uh, uh, now because he's killed an Egyptian and made a choice not to be a part of Pharaoh's system, but a part of God's people, he had to flee for his life. And he's in Midian. And when he got to Midian, he met a family. The guy was a priest of Midian. His name was Rule or Jethro. And uh, he had daughters. And so Moses married one of the daughters. And now he's a herdsman. And this has lasted for four years. He's been in a season of wilderness and, uh, and shepherding. And this is going to be very handy to him when he starts shepherding God's people through a wilderness experience. And, uh, so while he's, while he's there, he has this, uh, encounter with God and the burning bush and God speaks to him. God calls him to go back to Egypt and to stand before Pharaoh and to say, let my people go. And that's the calling of God. And I'm just giving it to us in, uh, in summary this morning, but he said, I'm going to deliver the people of God out of the hands of the Egyptians. And I'm going to use you as the uh, spokesperson for that. And uh, so that's where our setting is, or that's the context for this discussion this morning, because Abraham says, okay, uh, Moses says, okay, so I go back and I talk to Pharaoh and I talk to the people of God. And I say, the God of our father, Abram and Isaac and Jacob uh, has sent me to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And uh, he said, what if they ask me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? And God tells Moses, you tell them I am that I am. It's, it's a profound statement that no one else can make because God is self-existent. God is self-defining, self-sustaining, uh, and we are not. The psalmist makes a point of saying, he, he is God and we are not. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are the sheep of his pasture. And, uh, and so uh, there's this vast delineation between God and between man. And this is a definitive statement that only God can make. I am that I am. I will be whatever I choose to be. And he said, you tell them that I am has sent you. And so as we're looking at that today, we get this and we understand that throughout the, uh, the word of God, there are 1200 plus titles of God throughout, uh, the, the search and the study of God's word. Many of them are compound names, uh, and you know them as Jehovah and some, uh, some, uh, title in addition to that Jehovah Nisi, the banner over our lives, Jehovah Rephe, he's our healer, uh, Jehovah Shalom. Alone, God, our peace, and uh, that probably should be Yahweh Nisei, Yahweh Shalom, Yahweh, uh, but uh, we're not going to deal with that today, other than to say that there are many, many titles and many dispensational names for God, and uh, here he reveals himself as the I am that I am. Now, to begin with, in this discussion, we need to understand that there is only one God. 
And uh, here is the Shamal Israel. This is the highest utterance among the Hebrew people or among those that are followers after the, after the manner of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And here's Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God or one Lord. That is the Shema Israel. That is, that is the expression, the ultimate expression of knowledge about God. God is one. And it's not just numerically one. It's one as he is differentiated from everything and everybody else. There is no other like him. He elucidates on that throughout the scripture. He sets himself apart. He asks rhetorical questions. Is there another God? I know not one. He said there is no God beside me. The word of God said he walks up upon the face of the deep alone or all by himself. There is nobody like God. There are no no other gods. The gods of the nations are man-made objects that can't see and can't hear and can't stretch forth their hand to help or to save. And so the first bullet point in a discussion like this is you have to know there is only one God. Now there's a discussion about gods on the earth, but that's in the economy of uh, the theological economy of mankind. But that has nothing to do with the fact in reality that God is one. And uh, the New Testament writer will reinforce this. The Old Testament writer beats it like a drum. And then in uh, Deuteronomy 6 and 5, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. So uh, he's, he's involving a holistic approach to loving God, body, spirit, mind, and, uh, and uh, so you bring all of that into your worship. You worship God in your heart, which is your spirit. You worship God in your, in your soul, which I would uh, suggest to you is your mind. And you worship God in your might or your strength, which is your body. But you bring all of that into your worship with God. It's not enough that you're just here this morning. I'm glad, by the way, that you're here. It's, it's a wonderful morning to be in church. I appreciate the praise group, the great music the wonderful singing, all that goes into this. I appreciate everybody that's ministering in the house of God today. And so you get a lot of benefit just by being here, but you can't break through the barrier that separates you from what God has for you and the blessings of God in your life unless you begin to be involved because this is highly individualistic. You can't ride on somebody else's coattails into your destiny in the kingdom of God. You have to have your own experience with God and you have to first know that he's one and then you've got to know that I've got to bring everything I have into this relationship. I've got to get my mind on him. I've got to get my heart sold out to him and I've got to bring my body into line. Paul says, what? Know you not that you're the temple of the Holy Ghost? You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Uh, when I come to God and do business with him, at some point you realize I don't belong to myself anymore. I belong to God. And so I've got to, I've got to survey the word of God to find out what pleases him so that I can please him. I have to study the word of God to know what worship is because I was raised in a place where we didn't worship God. But I read in the word of God to clap your hands, all you people. People. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Praise him on high sounding cymbals and loud cymbals. Praise him with the timbrel. Praise him with the dance. There's a lot of... Um there's a lot of instructive material in the word about God about how to worship God. And you see clearly that you get all of you involved. You sing songs. You engage your mind. You engage your passion. You, you uh, involve your spirit and you involve your body in the worship of God. So God is one and we bring all that we are into our worship of that singular and unique God. It has been said, and I fully agree, that you can't know yourself or about your life or your destiny without knowing God. And when you come into relationship and know God, then for the very first time, you'll see yourself as you are. And more importantly, you'll see yourself as God sees you can be. And you'll see the vast potential that you have in the kingdom of God. And, uh, and so loving God begins with knowing God. And knowing God begins with there's only one God. So here's how 
the incarnation works. The incarnation is God in carne, God in flesh. And he comes to the earth in the form of a man. Now, he has come to earth in many ways by simply the breath of his spirit, uh, walking with Adam in the garden. God appears here to Moses in a burning bush. God appears to Abram in human form or in bodily form. Uh, he comes as the captain of the Lord's host. These are what we would call theophanies all through the Old Testament. But the incarnation is different because God is going to come to the earth in a body and that that body is going to be the central uh, feature in the redemptive process of mankind. Mankind has fallen away from God, is separated from God, has to be redeemed, and the redemption price is perfect, holy, sinless blood. And that blood is going to be supplied by a perfect, holy, sinless man. And that man we know as Jesus Christ. But the word Jesus or the name Jesus means God has become. It's one of those compound names. God has become our salvation. And so that is what we call the incarnation or God coming incarnate or in flesh. And here's how it works. You get prophecy about it. Uh, we'll just begin in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7 and 14. There, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, this is a Hebrew audience. This is a Hebrew prophet. Everybody speaks the language. So there's no need for the translation of the word Emmanuel. But in the New Testament in Matthew, which that book will be written in Greek and the the whole world speaks Greek now because the Greeks have been in power and in cultural influence for uh, 400 years and now the Romans are are in charge and have been for like 70 years but at uh, at this point the whole world speaks Greek and so uh, and so Matthew's going to interpret that Hebrew word or name Emmanuel for us in Matthew uh, chapter 1 behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us everyone say God with us so the incarnation is God with us, not God for us, nor God uh, uh, around us, but God with us. Now, soon we're going to get into a place of discussion, maybe not today, but if you continue in your study, you're going you're gonna, to uh, come to a place where you understand God's target is to not only be with you, but to be in you. God wants to dwell within you by his spirit. Uh, Isaiah goes on to say, for unto us us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called wonderful counselor everybody say the mighty God this baby that's going to be born, this child that's going to be born of a virgin, this one that will be called Emmanuel, beginning its life in the womb of a, of a mama, just like every one of us began, and, uh, and then born into the earth. This child, this baby boy, this Emmanuel is going to be, according to Isaiah, the mighty God. Now, how many gods are there? One. There's only one God. He is singular. He is differentiated. He is unique. And there's nothing or anyone else like him. And he is that God that is being born of a woman into a little fleshly body. Now, you don't have to understand that, but you do have to believe that. There's a lot of things about God. I would say most things about God we never will understand fully, but we have to believe those things. Somebody say, praise the Lord. He is the mighty God. Turn to your neighbor and tell him Jesus is the mighty God. Tell him the baby was the mighty God. Now, you know, the wonderful part about that while he's in that little body and while he's in Mary's womb, he's still holding the universe together. He's still holding all the processes of life and natural law together. And he hadn't missed a beat. God is not diminished because God comes into that little package of that body. Praise God. And he is fully and totally God while he's there. He's not only the mighty God. Who else is he? He's what? 
He's the everlasting father. So let me get this straight. You're saying the father is inside the son. That's exactly what Isaiah said. He said, that little baby is the mighty God. That little baby is the everlasting father. No wonder the angel split the heavens and began to sing in angelic chorus about peace on earth, goodwill toward men, because God himself had come to see about his creation. He is the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. Now, uh, John chapter one, in the beginning and John goes way back. John reaches back further than all the synoptic gospels. And he says, in the beginning was the word. And the word there in Greek is logos. It's the plan. It's the scheme. It's the design of God. And the word was with God. And everyone say the word was God. It's just like you uh, and your word are one and the same, except God has this phenomenal spiritual capacity. His word creates the heavens and the earth and his word never fails and his word is forever settled in the heavens and God is inseparable from his word. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. That might sound redundant, but it is absolutely conclusive. God is the creator and there isn't anything that God didn't make. Uh, verse 10 is a shocker to the natural world. He was in the world and the world was made by him. He's the creator God that was there before there was a garden or a man or a woman or a fall or a sin. He was there all by himself and he's God all by himself and he's complete all by himself the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came walking down their little dusty streets. He was on the shores of, of Galilee. He touched the lepers and he touched the blind and he sat with their children and he ate at Mary and Martha's house and he was in the world but the world around him had no idea who he was. Let me stop for just a second and suggest to you that this is an incredible display of the love of God. God for you because God came down from glory and robed himself in flesh and walked on the dust of the earth. He was the maker of it all, but he came here to do the business of redemption for us. My, what a savior, what a God, what a lover of our souls, what grace, what mercy. Praise God. And then Verse 14, and the word was made flesh. Verse 1 tells me that the word was God. And so if you don't mind, the word was made flesh is very strictly in this context. And God was made flesh and dwelt among us. Remember, he's the maker of the world, but the world didn't recognize him. While he was here, he was robed in flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And so we see him as the son of God. And we see him as the son of man. And we see him as Mary and Joseph's little boy. That's what the neighbors said about him. And that's what the people said about him. And later that's what, that's what the Pharisees said about him. And, uh, and they saw him as a carpenter and they saw him as a carpenter's son. And later they saw him as a rabbi and, and maybe they saw him as an insurrectionist and maybe they saw saw him as a rebeller against uh, Judaism or a rebeller against Rome and people saw him in all sorts of different ways but I want you to know who he was he was the mighty God he was the everlasting father he was the word incarnate in flesh he was the creator God walking on the earth that's who he was in in the book of John we get a lot of a, of a, of a, a repetitive uh, expression uh, that is, uh, in the Greek, it is the ego in me. Or if you would, it is the I am. And 
it, it, it comes to us like this. And it's not only in the New Testament, like if you're reading in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek uh, Old Testament that was in, in full force and had been for centuries before the birth of Jesus. Because the Greeks had been in power and the Greek language was universal. And so the uh, a really logical thing happened. And they took the old Aramaic scrolls and they took the old Hebrew scrolls and they converted them all into Greek and that was the Septuagint but it's interesting when you study in the Septuagint and you find the phrase I am and you find it ego in me and it's the same phrase that we're about to explore in the book of John John uh, chapter 8 verse 23 he's having a debate of sorts with the uh, with the Pharisees and he says unto them you are from beneath I am from above you are of this world I am not of this world I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins for if you believe not that I am he you shall die in your sins. Now, if you're reading that in, say, a King James or uh, a, a translation where they, uh, uh, they uh, spend some time and some money on, uh, on uh, correct expression, uh, you'll find that the word he there is in italics. And whenever you see the word, uh, the word in italics, say, for example, in your New Testament uh, 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 Bible, you're, you're, going to, you're going to find that the word he is not there in the original text, but the, but the translator feels like it's implied, so he adds it for clarification in the English. But uh, because it kind of dangles and it doesn't feel comfortable and it doesn't flow smoothly, if you say, unless you believe that I am... You shall die in your sins. But exactly that is what it says. The ego in me is here. And it says simply that if you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. You believe not that I am. Now, there are a multitude of statements that Jesus makes throughout the New Testament that are connected with this expression, I am. But none so clear as this passage in John chapter 8. Verily, verily, verse 51, verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said unto him, now we know that you have a devil because Abraham is dead and the prophets and thou sayest, sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thyself? Now you don't misunderstand. They are hearing him. They are hearing him and they are at a real deficit because they're thinking and they're hearing in the natural. Let me stop for one second and tell you that Abraham is not dead. Abraham is alive and that the prophets and Jacob and Isaac, they are not dead. You say, well, brother, son, we're thousands of years this side of those people. Those bodies are turned back into dust. Well, if you think life is all about this flesh, then you're operating at a deficit and you are lacking understanding. You need to know that when you lay that body down, the only part of you that really matters is still going on into eternity. Your body is, is the, the weakest, the simplest, the, uh, the, uh, the least important. It is incidental to what God wants to do in your spirit. Somebody say praise the Lord. So death, death is not an ending. Death is a doorway. Death is a transition. But you go right on through that. If you've ever had questions about death or you've been worried about death, you better not worry about death. You, you need to worry about life before God without being in the covenant. You need to get yourself right with God because death is coming to everybody's body. But God has created a program where you can live forever with him. They said, who do you think you are? Abraham is dead and the prophets are dead. We just think you have a devil. Uh, you're telling us things that are just off the wall and, and, and really outrageous. And, uh, and so this is Jesus' response. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. 
Now, some say that that means that Abraham looked in a visionary sense down through the ages and saw the birth of Christ and it made him happy. I want to, I want to suggest to you that just as Moses and Elijah were alive with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and talked to him about the events that were about to happen in Jerusalem, i.e. the crucifixion. And they were Moses in spirit and Elijah, I don't know, because he went up body and all. And, uh, but they were there and they were fully identified as Moses of old and Elijah of old. I'm just telling you, they stepped through the veil out of the heavenlies onto that mountaintop and Peter and James and John were there. And just like they're alive in the presence of God, the writer of Hebrews says we are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. And I don't think he's just talking about the testimonies of people long ago that have gone by that we are somehow responsible to. But I'm believing that they're looking over the ramparts of heaven and they're there right now. And I, I just got to I just got to feel like they're saying, come on, you can do this. Come on, you can live for God. Come on you can obey God come on it's going to be worth it all and so when he says Abraham saw my day and rejoiced I think Abraham was right there in the middle of Moses and Elijah and Isaac and Jacob and when the angels began to sing I don't think it was just the angels choir singing I think all of heaven was saying now we're down to business now God's about to bring this thing to pass that he's promised by the prophets for generations and so, are you greater than our father Abraham? He said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, this is impossible. You're not even 50 years old yet. And have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, who, before Abraham was, I am. Now, I want to suggest something to you. Nobody can say that but God. Nobody has the title to that, but God. Nobody is self-sustaining, self-existing, but God. And you know who was standing before them? It was God. He was the, he was the mighty God. Remember Abraham? Remember Isaac? Uh, remember remember uh, Isaiah 9 and 6? He is the baby. He is the child, but he's the mighty God. Remember, he is the everlasting father. If we wanted to, we could go on and pluck a, a number of other Old Testament scriptures out. But here we have Jesus saying, listen to me. I'm the God that talked to Moses out of the burning bush. I'm the God that brought them out of Egypt. I'm the God that split the Red Sea. I'm the God that made the manna every morning. I'm the God of the tower of fire and cloud. He's standing before them. Now, the commentaries will tell you what Jesus meant. But I am really sensitive to the witness on the ground, on the deck, that literally heard him before modern Christianity was born. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. Because God, you got to get this, God is not a was or not a will be. God is eternally present. Time is something he created for the process of life and redemption on the earth. But God lives outside of time. God is always am. God was, God was am in the garden. God was am with, I don't even know how to frame the language. God was present at the, at the burning bush. God was present all along every historical milestone throughout the Old Testament. And he is every bit present in this house today. No less, no different. Everything has ever been for anybody. He is that today. If he would speak to you today, he would say, I am. And then they took up stones to cast at him. Why? Because they think he's blaspheming. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. So to illustrate their mindset or what was happening to them uh, wonderfully, the Bible gives us another scenario very near to this in John chapter 10. And it explains to us what they were thinking. So John chapter 10, we pick it right back up. He's fighting with them again. John 10 and 30, I and my father are one. 
He doesn't mean one in harmony. He doesn't mean one in unity. He means one as one is numerically. He, wa- he means to tell you that if you're looking at me, you're looking at God. If you're listening to me, you're listening to God. And there's only one God. And right now, I'm not walking in the garden right now. I'm not in the burning bush right now. I'm not sitting in Abraham's door right now. I'm not the captain of the Lord's host right now. I'm incarnate in flesh and I'm standing in front of you. And this flesh is the house of God. What do you think he was talking about in John 2 when he told him, tear down this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. He was talking about the temple of his body. It's the temple of God. He said, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. They're always going to stone him. And uh, Jesus answered them and said, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? Because he's been healing people and feeding multitudes and and cleansing lepers. And he's been doing, I mean, his fame is abroad. And it's just amazing the good work that he's done. And he's asking them a very uh, apropos question. What are you stoning me for? And they said the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Now who did his audience understand him to say that he was who did those that were on the deck in the street that day what did they hear him say they heard him say that he was God now I want you to just stop we want to lock this down and set the emergency brake and walk away from it for a second because North America has been heavily affected by European theology that began to break out in the in the uh, Protestant Reformation and that was shaped and formed by Catholic theology that was born three, four, five hundred years after these events, after the Christ and after the apostles. In the day of Jesus and the apostles, there was only one church. In the day of Jesus and the apostles, it came out of Judaism. It was one God. It was one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is above all, through all, and in you all. Ephesians chapter 4. There was no Trinity. It's not in the Bible. It wasn't in the conversation. It's not in the scripture. It didn't exist before Catholicism created it in 300, 400 AD. So if you read the commentaries, you're going to find all sorts of contorted, tortured language that says, yes, he was one with God, but he's a separate person from God. And and there's only one God, but there's three. And you want to do business with these people. You want to do business. You don't want to drive over a bridge that they build. Because numbers don't matter to them. You don't want to depend on them building something. But you want to do business with them because you give them one dollar and it's just the same. They give you three. And we do that all day long. But they won't do it because they know numerically one is one and three is three. But theologically, they kick the walls down and say it can be anything we want it to be. But you can only do that if you were born out of paganism, out of pagan Greece, and out of pagan Rome. And you had this desire for a multiplicity of gods. And so you made a female god named Mary. And you learned and you began to teach baptizing little babies. And, and, you, and you made the Pope the infallible word of God. And all the things that they did there, they are those that created the Trinity. And then when Luther broke away from them, Luther was a priest. Luther came uh, and, and he began the Protestant Reformation with the Trinity in mind. And never stepped away from it. And so all of those Protestant reformers were Trinitarians and they were all Catholic. But when these guys are standing in the street with Jesus, they are one God Jews. They are monotheistic Jews. And they hear this man saying, I am and my father and I are one. And all they hear, you're a man and you're making yourself to be God. 
they, they heard him loud. They heard him clear. And they heard him right. They were just upside down. He wasn't a man making himself to be God. He was God that had made himself into a man. Somebody ought to give him a little high praise and magnify him and worship him. He's worthy. Ah, God, God, mighty God, you're the only true and living God. He's talking to his guys. He's talking to his guys and he's telling them about the father and and they want to know. John 14 and 7, if you had known me, You should have known my father also, and from henceforth you know him. Who did they know? And have seen him. Who had they seen? And Philip said, "Mm, show us the father, and it suffices us. And Jesus said, Philip, have I been so long time with you, and yet you still don't know me? He said, you're just not getting this, Philip. He that has seen me has seen the father god is a spirit god dwells in unapproachable light god is a spirit no man has seen god at any time the only begotten of the father he has declared him he has if you would manifest him so this is god unseeable becoming visible this is god untouchable becoming touchable this is god unknowable becoming knowable through the manifestation of his body first uh, second corinthians 5 and 19 to wit or know this it's like hear ye hear ye that god was in christ god is the eternal spirit the creator the god of the old testament The Christ is the body, the anointed one. God dwelled in that body. And really, if you want to know, that body is the prototype for who you are supposed to be in the kingdom of God. Filled with the spirit of God. Filled with the word of God. Led by the kingdom of God. You're going to die if you live long enough. And God's going to raise your body up just like he raised his up. And you're going to have an immortal body that lives forever with God in his immortal body. Colossians chapter 2. Turn to your neighbor and say, beware. You may even want to shake your finger at them a little bit. Tell them, beware. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After tradition of men. After the rudiments of the world. And not after Christ. For in him. Tell them emphatically. For in him dwelleth half. Half the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You're not doing what I told you to do. You're supposed to be talking to your neighbor, shaking your finger, and repeating after me. And, and for, for in him dwelleth a third of the Godhead bodily. You're, you're insubordinate. You're rebellious, a stiff-necked, and unruly people. What do you mean all? I'm telling you a third. Don't you know anything about the Trinity? That he's a third of the, and, and, and the, the conversation is Jesus' place in the Godhead. But that's not the conversation to have. For in him, tell him again, dwelleth 99 and 9 tenths percent. All, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Check it out. Understand it. Jesus is not a member of the Godhead. Jesus is not a part of a corporate entity or a committee. All Jesus is not in the Godhead. The Godhead is in Jesus. And you are complete in him. He's everything you need, which is the head of all principality and power. When you call on the name of Jesus, listen, if you're a disturbed and frantic Trinitarian and you don't know who to pray for half the time, you want to give equal time to the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And you just, oh, I, I, I was raised that way. And so I had that confusion when I was approaching God. But if you're, if you're coming to the biblical uh, uh, domain, you understand that when you call on the name of Jesus, you're calling on the Father. When you call on the name of Jesus, 
you're calling on the son when you call on the name of Jesus you're calling on the holy you're calling on the lamb you're calling on the lion of the tribe of Judah you're calling on the lily of the valley the great rose of Sharon you're calling on the God of all the Old Testament prophets and patriarchs all in that name of Jesus and here, First, First Timothy three sixteen, and everybody say, "I won't argue with you." <laughs> Without controversy, Paul said, it's, "It's not it's not a thing of argument." Great is the mystery of godliness. It's a mystery how God exists and how he created the universe and the universe is in him. He's hanging out on all the other sides and I can't even go there because I think spatially because I'm ex existential and I, and I have to have boundaries and everything. But he, there is no boundary with him. He's out there beyond it all. I can't even get there. I can't even comprehend that. My little brain just falls off the edge. But uh, great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery that he speaks and starts stars were created and that he calls them all by name and he holds them all in place and not one of them fails great is the mystery of godliness he made your neurological system and your vascular system and David said we are fearfully and wonderfully made and just the anatomy of a human cell or down at the subatomic level the things that hold all the particles together it's an amazing thing when you think about who he is and what he's done Great is the mystery of godliness. I won't argue with you. There's a lot about it I can't understand and I can't see. But here's something I can see. God was manifest in the flesh. Not a part of God. Not a piece of God. But all of God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit. Seen of angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. And believed on in the world. And received up into glory. All of that pertains to the man, Christ Jesus. Let's clap our hands into him and bless his name. I got to quit. You okay? So. When all this starts happening, and it happens in Bible studies all the time, it happened to me. When I was in Bible study, it just hit me like a freight train. I'm sitting there. I'm studying these scriptures. Uh, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're seeing this for the very first time. And, and the first thing that comes to my mind and out my mouth, you're saying, you're saying that it was God on the cross. And they're like, he sees it. He sees it. Uh, when my wife saw it, Skip Shenever, big, big Greek guy, he's like, she see that, she see that, and uh, and he was right. We did see it, but I have people in Bible study ask me about that. You're saying it was Jesus on the cross? Ah, that's right. You got it. You're saying it was God on the cross? That's right. That's right. Come on in. And they say, but. How can that be? You're saying that God died. And we're like, yes, yes, yes. And then their brain goes on full tilt because they can't understand because they think that who was running the universe and it's cessation of being. And it can't be that God knows an end or something. Well, you don't understand death. That's the problem with the Pharisees talking to Jesus. Death is not an end. Death is a doorway. God just blew through, set the timer on three days and blew through, took up his body again. Yes, it was God on the cross. Yes, God laid down the only body that he ever wore that was made out of flesh. And then in three days, he took it up again. And he's wearing it right now. You say, that was God on the cross? Listen, Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, of God, of God, which he, God, hath purchased with his own blood. Who was on the cross? God was. Who bled on the cross? God did. 
wait a minute. God's a spirit. Spirits don't bleed. That's why he had to make that body. You're catching on to the plan. He overshadowed Mary and said, I got I to gotta die on a cross. I got to bleed for these people. I'm going to make my little body here in Mary. Joseph, you can't be a part of this. He's got to be a perfect little man. He's got to be without sin. He can't be from Adam's nature. And the nature comes through the patriarchal line. I'm going to make this in Mary's womb. And she's going to bear me like a regular little baby boy. But there's nothing regular about him at all. He's there walking. And he's learning how to walk and not totter over. He didn't come out running and dancing. He came out falling and slobbering just like you did. And he had to learn to eat his green beans. And he had to learn to obey his mama and his daddy. He had to learn all of that. But don't make a mistake about it. Every day of that experience, every time Mary picked him up, she was picking up God. Have you heard that song, Mary, did you know? He's God Almighty, robed in flesh, come to give himself. Have you ever asked yourself the question, when Jesus clearly in Matthew 28, 19, commands his disciples to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, every one of those morons went out and baptized exclusively in the name of Jesus. Nobody in the New Testament went out and baptized. I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Nobody, Paul didn't do that. Neither did any of the other apostles. They all baptized. Acts chapter 2, Peter said, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Acts chapter 8, Philip is down in Samaria and he baptizes them in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 10, and Paul, uh, rather Peter, is in the house of Cornelius the Italian and, uh, and those soldiers and his family and he baptizes them in the name of the Lord and the King James. And if you're in the NIV it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, Acts chapter 19 Paul finds some that have already been baptized at Ephesus and he baptizes them again because they didn't do it right they didn't do it in the name of Jesus so what was Jesus talking about? It's easy. Break the thing down just like you did in the eighth grade. Uh, baptize them in the name, singular noun name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Ghost. Three prepositional phrases all covered by that single noun name. One name, one single name is going to cover the Father. It's going to cover the, well, we know we read Isaiah 9 and 6. That little baby is the Father. He's the everlasting Father. What's his name? He is the son. He's the body that God wore on the earth. But what's his name? Jesus. He is the Holy Ghost. Because when he rose from the dead, he said, fellas, I'm leaving. But I'm coming back. And, uh, and you're going to go do the work of the church. And what happened to him in Acts chapter 2? They received the Holy Spirit. They received the Spirit of Christ. They received Jesus inside in an in a outpouring of his redeemed and resurrected spirit. Somebody say praise the Lord. It is once you get into it, it's simple. It's easy. Musicians, you're lurking. Come on. Give them hope. Are y'all singing? Come on. Don't, don't wait on me. Everybody say praise the Lord. This is one of my favorite. I, I, whatever I'm working on at present is my favorite scripture. This is my favorite scripture. It's like, who's that, Megan? Yeah. Whatever we were eating that night, it's like, this is my favorite. Now, this, is, this is my favorite. Revelation 22 and verse 1. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Everybody say, the throne of God and of the Lamb. So, language is pretty specific, pretty exact. Language is something, it means what it says. And people distort it and twist it and torture it and do all kinds of things to it. But they're not being faithful to the language. Neither are they being faithful to the author. But here, you can only do this. There's one throne. It's singular here. And that's reinforced by Revelation chapter 4. John said he heard a voice. He, he saw in the heavens one throne and one sat upon the throne. 
And so here we have a throne and it's the throne of God and of the lamb. So you have, you only have one of two choices. It's either a throne, a singular throne with two on it. One is God and one is the lamb. And I can't see it any other way than I see a human like person sitting there with a lamb on his lap. Or it's one person and he is God and he is the lamb and he is the Christ and he is the creator and he is. So we go down to verse three for clarification and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the lamb again shall be in it. And here's where language is so very revealing and so absolutely specific and their servants shall serve them. Hmm? You're muttering. Listen to me. Their servants shall serve them. God and the lamb, they're a committee and their servants shall serve them. What? His servants. Oh, it does say his, doesn't it? His is singular masculine third person. And it simply means that the one seated on the throne is singular. And he is both God and the lamb. His servants shall serve him and they shall see their faces. They shall see their faces. God's got a face. Lamb's got a face. Same face. Paul says we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And they shall see his face because there's only one on the throne. And his name shall be in their foreheads. Praise God. Let's stand together. If you love the word of God and you love what God has done and what he's doing, let's begin to give him praise and thank him now. Ah, we bless your name, oh God. We praise your name, almighty oh God. If you've never gone down in the water in Jesus' name, come to this altar today and talk to God. We've got water. We'll put you down. God will wash every sin away. God will cleanse you of everything you've ever been that's not like God. If you've been baptized, but it was in some other form or some other mode, Paul would say today, got to rebaptize you in the name of Jesus. Because there's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father who's above all, through all, and in you all. God's ways are true. God's ways are best. God is the only way. Let's love him. Let's praise him in the house right now. Come on, church family, why don't you come down and just let's pray and let's magnify God. Lay your hand on somebody, take somebody by the hand, draw close.
whatever you need this morning. He is the I am. He's your healer. He's your provider. He's your deliverer. You need to lift up your voice and begin to thank and praise him. Whatever you have need of, he is that. No other name. No other name. I am your way maker. But the name of Jesus. I am your healer.
the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. 